And we are at the GBU Life Campus View Club here at the Peterson Event Center, and our special guest host, <laughs> Associate Head Coach Tim O'Toole. Tim, thanks for stopping by tonight. Thanks for having me. You Appreciate me? it. Excited. Um, this is a rarity that you get a week to yeah. work. What are some of the things? What do you want to take advantage of during this week? Well, a couple of things. I think we have to address some of the issues that we've had in areas that we can get better in, that we have to get better moving forward. You do have time to let the bodies heal a little bit. You know, if you're going two-day prep game, two-day prep game, uh, you're not able to get back and kind of recover enough. And so I think that's part of this thing. And then it's also, hey, we're in the beginning of January. And it can seem because the pressure is kind of real and it gets heavy. But we've got a lot of basketball left. And we, and we need to be in better shape. We need to get, you know, stay resilient and hardened. And, uh, and we need to really get better to keep moving forward. And we've got a little bit of time to kind of refocus our lens. There's physical work. But how much is also the mental of like, hey, maybe take a day and just forget about everything and, and relax? Or how do you work on that part of it with the student athletes? Considering, I mean, they're teenagers to early 20s. Well, I think one of the biggest things we have to do, it's almost like you have to have the mindset of a relief pitcher. And what happened was, and I remember Mike Bray saying this a couple of years ago, I used to do television for ESPN. And Notre Dame was really good. And this was back in the days of the old Big East. And they were ranked 10th or 15th in the country, somewhere in that range, and they lost seven in a row. And in those days, though, when you played Pittsburgh and you played Syracuse and then you played at Louisville and you're at West Virginia, you know, your schedule was brutal. And I think the reality is in the ACC, you can't get too high or too low after a game. And when you can kind of flush out the last one and get on to the next one, it's really important because you have to stop the slide and go forward. And I think for our team right now, that's really imperative, especially after what happened with Duke the other night, that we got to, you know, again, refocus that lens and let's get ready for Syracuse because that's the next thing right in front of us and that's all we've got. One of the things we've really seen from this team is the buy-in seems there. Like they seem collected, they, they seem all in into what you guys are doing. No, absolutely right. But, and you just mentioned something before about the physicality. And I think the reality is right now still in January like we need to be physical and we need to keep working on being physical there's a time in February when you got to pull that back because you're going to need whatever gas you got left in the tank to kind of get you through February into March and then hopefully April but right now is not that time and so especially after the other night and that was the one takeaway from Duke they were incredibly physical those guards cut incredibly hard they would grab you and especially for the twins because they're kind of slender and even fetty it's like if they grab you you have to get them off of you and then let let the referee make a decision and so that was you know again even for today it's like going back over the film that's going to be a physical confrontation that somehow you can't let people manhandle you around and uh, so there is a physical element that we're still dealing with that we have to have to deal with moving forward so how does that get better how it gets better? <laughs> well, again, it's almost like a nutcracker drill in football. Over a period of time, you're going to realize you're either going to do the hitting or you're going to get hit. And then a lot of times what you realize is you don't want to keep getting hit because after a while that, that's not a lot of fun. And so at some point, especially in, in that game the other night, if they're going to grab you, you've got to write the hit them off you. I want to ask that's you, how you, it you, mentioned, you mentioned your, your TV days. What yeah. was it like for you? <laughs> I mean, the coach is, it, it is in your blood to, to watch and – commentate and did that kind of re-energize you like listen I don't want to be here I want to be on a on a sideline you know it's funny I don't want you to take this the wrong way but one of the things they talked about when you were an analyst doing games was at the end of the game you could take the headset off <laughs> and then go about your regular business and the only thing I kept thinking about at the end of those games was I wish I was in that locker room right now I mean, after everyone, and I love the broadcasting, but the reality was, as you mentioned, I think it's in my blood, and I would rather be in there win or lose and then trying to figure out and have those, those highs and those lows than taking off the headset and getting on to the next thing. I miss, I, I miss that, that team bonding that, that was always part of that locker room and uh, probably why I got back into it. You'd be surprised at how much tape I listen to. No, <laughs> I don't get it. I get it. I get it. <laughs> hey, you know, I saw you uh, before the game the other night, and – you know, you're, you're focused on drills, and then you go and you're hugging this media guy. <laughs> and I'm like, it's one of the newer media guys in the conference, uh, Jim Beheim. Like, of all the jobs I ever would have thought that Jim Beheim would be doing, a media would not be uh, anywhere near yeah. the top of the list. <laughs> I'm sorry to be laughing so hard, but, uh, but you're absolutely right. You know, I, I was fortunate to work for Coach Beheim from 91 to 95, so in the 90s, especially when the Big East was, was really rolling back then. 
Um, and then I worked from 2012 to 13. And so he's been like a second father to me. And uh, so when I grabbed him and now that he's doing media, I was like, hey, you're great at this. And he started <laughs> laughing. He was like, I don't know if I'm great at this. But I did say one of the things you learn in, in the media was that Coach Beheim, you've had 47 years of being a head coach in Division One. You know what it's been like in those locker rooms. You know what it's like to beat John Thompson. You know what it's like to win a national championship. You can take all this experience and share it with the audience because that's what you're trying to do when you're in media. And uh, and he's just got a, such a breadth of, of – of this availability to share and offer. And I, I think it's a great thing. And um, it was great to see him because he's also not like a hugging guy. And I'm like, hey, get over here. <laughs> and, um, but he, he was great. And, uh, and he's not going to be here for our game. I guess he's not doing any of the Syracuse stuff. So, but anyway, he's a great guy and a great man. And, uh, and I love him. So it was Is he going to do well in media? I think so. I, I do think, he again, he's got so much to share. Uh, you know, when you think, if you Google Syracuse University right now – uh, <laughs> yes. um, when you look up Syracuse University, the first thing that's going to come up is either Jim Bay or the 2 3 zone. Not knocking Newhouse School of Communication <laughs> or any of these other things, but <laughs> it, it, it's, his imprint has been massive. And especially when you think about the sport of basketball and you're watching these games, and invariably, teams going to go to a zone. Well, who knows better than zone? than him, nobody on the planet. And so I wish he would kind of share, because I do think one of the things about Coach Beheim, he's a genius. Like, he's a mathematical genius. And all the stuff he did with his own was based on probability and percentages. And over a period of time, if you did this and you did that, would it improve or, or, or decrease the probability of that shot going in? I think that's where he's been unbelievably underrated. Um, and he has all of that to share with the audience, whether he'll do it or not. Those were always his secrets. Right. But he's not coaching anymore, so you can let the cat out of the bag. I just thought he didn't know anything else. <laughs> he only knew the 2-3. That's all he knew about basketball. Well, not th really. this is pretty cool about the 2-3. How we learned the 2-3 was they played Penn State, and they were really good. Syracuse was really good with Dave Bing, and Penn State beat the living hell out of them by about 35 points, and they played this 2-3. And he was so you know, just dumbstruck on what happened and how it happened and why that he started to study it. So through that adversity, all of a sudden it paid dividends for him for the next 50 years of his life. Yes, it did. Yeah. Uh, coming up, a friend of yours, someone you hear on every pit broadcast, you see at every pit game, and he is a new board of trustees member. We're wow. going to talk to him <laughs> next as we continue. It's the Jeff Cable Show on the Pit Panthers Radio Network. And we are in the GBU Life Campus View Club, Jeff Hathorne and Associate Head Coach Tim O'Toole. And right now we are joined by not just a great pit player, not just a great pit broadcaster now, a member of the Board of Trustees at the University of Pittsburgh. Congratulations, Curtis Aiken. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. I really appreciate that. I feel honored. Curt Curtis, how did this all come about? Well, I mean, uh, I, to be honest with you, I really had uh, really thought about serving uh, on the Board of Trustees. I always think about serving our university in any capacity that I can, but I never really thought about it. And about two months, maybe three months ago, uh, Governor Shapiro, I was at his residence for a, for a function, and he walked up to me and said, hey, I have an idea. I said, what's that? And he said that... Uh, I think you would do well at the Board of Trustees at the Univers University of Pittsburgh. So I kind of thought he was joking, and he said, no, I'm serious. And he told me a little bit about it, and he said he wanted to uh, submit my name to the Senate uh, as his nom nominee for the position. So I was overwhelmed, enjoyed, and, and uh, just uh, taken back, to be honest with you. So it's now Mr. Aiken, correct? Yeah, do we have to call you Mr. Curtis? This is big time. Hey... <laughs> Not at all. Curtis, we're fine. <laughs> That's a fib. I think it's all of the above. You, you obviously had a hey, great... Jeff, hey, Jeff, don't forget we have to go on the road from time to time, so that... be careful with this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Curtis, when your career was over, and it was a great career here at Pitt, why did you want to make your home in Pittsburgh? Uh, it, was very, it was very simple. After my freshman year in college, just the experience that I had, the people I met, um, I just couldn't see myself anywhere else. I mean, this, it, it was a whirlwind of freshman year. Just got exposed to just so much and so many great people here that I just I knew that at that point, you know, I, I wanted to make Pittsburgh my home. So it was, it was early. Um, it, was, uh, it was one of the best decisions I made. And, uh, it's just a wonderful city. It's amazing. I'm going to chime in too, Jeff, because yeah. Curtis knows this because I was fortunate or unfortunate enough to play against Curtis. 
and uh, and I knew, you know, unfortunately firsthand, Curtis, how great of a player you were, and and, and really, and in Bass, and I'm do, I'm counting through my hands right now about that was the '80s, the '90s, you know, the 2000s, the 2010s, yeah. 20s. Here we are, and you're on the board of trustees, yep. and it's really a testament to you, and 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 not and your talent. You know, it started out in, in on the court, obviously, at least how I knew you, but everything else is just kind of taken off in a great direction for you, and and we're blessed to have you. So congratulations, by the way. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate that. I know that the, it's time to roll up my sleeve and go to work now, too. So there's more on my plate, and I welcome For his For his uh, players listening, Curtis, what kind of fundamentals did Tim play with? <laughs> it, all, the, the aggressiveness that he's speaking about, <laughs> the, the, tackling that he's around, the tackling that he's hitting around. No, he, he, Tim, Tim was a, a really, really good player in his own right. I mean, I, I mean that with all due respect. I mean, he... He was a player, man. He uh, he played with force. So they talk about. I know where that came from. Jeff uses that word force a lot, but that, that's what that's what Tim, that's what Tim played uh, with. You're too kind, Curtis. You had 50 on me. I haven't forgotten that. Seriously, close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, he gave it to everybody. It wasn't just me. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Curtis, you, you've you've watched every game. You've been a, a part of the team. Um, what are your impressions? You you remember your freshman year? Uh, I want to start off with Bub Carrington and. What are your impressions and how difficult that is that first year, when you, especially when you get into conference play? Oh, it's extremely difficult because at that point, you know, you become a mark man if you're the best player on the team. Now you're going to truly going to be the best coaches that can, you know, game, game, game prep for individuals, not just for the team. But, you know, they've thrown a lot of stuff I've never seen before. And the coaches, meaning our staff, have to coach on the fly. They have to recognize they're throwing at them at that particular time and make adjustments and you know I just it's really really tough for you to get it but I, I tell you, you know he's I think he's mature I don't know how you feel about this but I think he's mature beyond his age I mean is, uh, he plays like a kind of an old school type of uh, player he's really he plays from the shoulders up I mean he's a really sharp kid but again I said that he's getting hit with a lot of things he's never seen before I think he's handling I don't think he's getting over emotional uh, obviously, frustration is going to take its toll because things aren't going to always go the way you plan, particularly when you're starting to play on this level. I mean, if you keep playing. And, uh, but I, I think he'll make the adjustment. He's in, a, he's in that period now where he's trying to find himself and make that adjustment, find a sweet spot or when to make the, you know, uh, make the right decision, right play. It's just a lot coming at him. And not to mention you know, being a good player in this league, and you know, I'm still sure. With social media, who knows what else is coming at him, right, Tim? No, you're, you're spot on. And one of the things I was thinking too, Curtis, who were some of the guys that were the upperclassmen when you were a rookie back then in the Big East? You had Mullen and you had Pickney. And yeah. who, who were some of the other guys? Yeah. Ewing? Well, well, yeah, uh, yeah, Ewing. In the, in the Big East that we played against yeah. or on our team? Yeah, there was, uh, no, you played well, against. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, Mark Jackson, we had Chris Mullen. We had you know, Billy Donovan over at Providence. Yeah. And Otis Thorpe over Providence, uh, Syracuse, we had Wendell Electus, Raphael Addison. Uh, was Tony Pearl Rick there? Ewan. Pearl was there. Yeah, he, he played a couple years before he went hardship. Um, St. John's, you mentioned uh, Walter Berry. Walter, yep. yeah, Walter Berry was there, uh, Willie Glass, and then, of course, Georgetown had you know, Patrick Ewan and those guys. Mm. Well, it's That's interesting. Pretty good. The reason I brought that up, Curtis, you brought a great point. Not only are you going up against really good players, but then you're going up against, in that case, was Lou Carnesecca, and it was P.J. Carlissimo, it was Rolly Massimino, it was Coach Bayheim, I think Coach Paul, Thompson. John Thompson. Like, you had Hall of Fame guys and then NBA players. And so when you mentioned about Bub Carrington, and there's a lot of things being thrown at him, and that's true. You, you hit the nail on the head. Not only are you playing against these other really good players that are probably going to be pros someday, but you've got entire staffs that are going out of their way to try to find every way to maximize his weaknesses and minimize his strengths. That's the reality. And with that comes hardship. It comes understanding. It, there's a lot of growing involved with that. And, and you hit that nail on the head, Kurt. Thank you. Because he is going through all yeah. that right now. Right, and I see it as a broad growing up right in front of us. I see him making adjustments from game to game and getting back, you know, trial by error, right? Yeah. He's, I think he's really starting to. Curtis, be, before we let you go, uh, we gave uh, Bub a little grief last week and said that he wore number seven for Ben Roethlisberger uh, because, you know, obviously he's from Baltimore and he is a big Ravens fan. You are from Buffalo, my friend. <laughs> 
And uh, the Steelers go up there on Sunday. Are you carrying a terrible towel, or are you part of Bill's Mafia? <laughs> That's a great question, but i tell you this. Uh, Art Rooney came to my swearing-in ceremony on Wednesday. He asked me that same question. He said, okay, Curtis, we <laughs> playing Buffalo next weekend. Who, who, who are you rooting for? I said, well, Mr. Rooney, uh, I don't know their coach. My family is a personal friend. I know his kids. I know his wife. I said, and I don't think the owner of the Buffalo Bills would show up to my swearing in ceremony like you are today. So <laughs> I'm rooting for my There you go. We got, we got a Steeler fan from Buffalo. Hey, Curtis, I, I am so happy for you. I don't think the Board of Trustees could find a better man uh, to be a part of that group than you. I have always appreciated working with you. And uh, best of luck and congratulations. Thank you guys so much, man. You did a great job earlier. I was listening to you. Keep up the good work. Congrats again, Kurt. Coming up, okay, buddy. It, coming up, it is the 50th anniversary of an Elite Eight season here at the University of Pittsburgh. And Billy Knight is going to join us as we continue on the Jeff Cable Show on the Pitt Panthers Radio Network. It is the 50th anniversary of the 1973-74 Panthers team, 25-4, and four, Elite Eight. Billy Knight averaged 22 points, 13 rebounds. Over the span of his career, had 50 double-doubles. You averaged a double-double for your career, uh, and we are honored to have you here. Thanks for stopping by. Well, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate being here, and uh, congratulations to Curtis. That's a great honor. Isn't great. that amazing? Great. And you've known him for oh, yeah. he, a few years. He deserves it. He's a, he's a class guy, great guy. And and you also, we all learned the lesson, you never try to outdress Curtis. No. <laughs> that will never happen. That's not going to happen. No. Never. He can dress in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> Billy, we, we were talking earlier. Can you believe it? It's 50, 50 years. years. No, I can't believe it. I must be old. I must be old. That's a long time ago. Veteran. Long time. So it was. It's it's great though. It's um, great memories, and you know you make such great friends that are lifetime friendships when you're in college. Uh, your teammates and and the people around the team and people in the city, um, and they've been lifetime friendships, and that's that's the greatest thing of of it all. You went on to play in the pros, but is that what made it special here? It, it's just something different about being college teammates than it is, than it was in the pros. Oh, it's the greatest, it's the greatest times of your life. I mean, I can say that when my, when my wife isn't around, it was the best thing that's ever happened to me, but, <laughs> but, um, no, college, college is, is the, is the best times of your life. And, um, all of us felt that way because we were close friends. Sure. On the court, we played well together. We got along, but we also uh, were friends off the court. And, um, you know, we played against each other in the summers and we got to know each other, you know, real well uh, throughout that time because there was no, no portal or, no, you know, nobody left. I mean, everybody was, was here, was here to stay. There was no leaving early. None of that was going on. So uh, we got to know each other really well and uh, got to be good friends, and, and everyone still is. Is that what made – is that friendship, that knowing each other, what made that team so good on the court as well? Well, I think so, sure. Sure, you got to have chemistry. You, 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 that, that is part of being a good team. But um, it's probably more than that. I mean, you, you, you know, we had good coaching. I mean, the Coach Riddle and Coach uh, uh, Webster and, and Coach Gerg, I mean, that, that was a great coaching staff that um, – you know, because Coach Webster was inventing the amoeba defense at that time, and Coach Gerg and Coach Riddle implemented it to the umpteenth degree, and um, we didn't know what we were doing out there sometimes. That's why the other team couldn't figure out what we were doing. Because, uh, we, you know, we'd have three guys playing a zone, two playing uh, a man-to-man. So, yeah, how did that work? Like, well, and the, how did you communicate through that? Well, I mean – it you know it had principles that you were supposed to follow when the ball goes into the corner you double team it and then the other three guys are in the zone uh if you're in a if you're in a um uh, a man to man and the ball goes over your head you you go into a zone i mean there were principles but sometimes those principles got overlooked during the game and uh, there was confusion and uh, sometimes that helped us we are in the peterson event center right now and there's a generation of fans that only know basketball in this building, 
How would you describe to them what a packed field house was like? Uh, the best thing I remember is the, uh, the popcorn. You can smell the popcorn while you're playing. And that, that's probably why I'm addicted to popcorn now. I eat it all the time. But um, it was just a close, intimate, more setting. I, I don't know how many people had seated, 5,000 or so. Um, but they were right on top of you, and, um, and you felt it. You felt it. You could tell. I mean, you could, you could look into the fans of people you knew and um, – Bill Hillgrove's son, Billy, was running on the court during the game sometimes. Uh, they had to get him off the court. Tiger Paul running up and down the sidelines. And and the other fans that you knew and recognized, um, you know, it was a very uh, intimate, close close setting. Is there a memory or two that really – you guys are going to get together here next month. I, I'm yeah. sure there will be all kinds of memories. Some of them might even be true. Some yeah. might be true. What are a couple that just stick out to you? Um, I don't know. There, there's so many great, great times that, that, that happened while you were in college that um, um, it's hard to pick out just one or two uh, special, special ones. I mean, Lucius Keys, I mean, how much the crowd loved him uh, when he got into the games. I, I remember things like that, that wow. uh, he got to score a basket or do something special on the court and the, and the fans would give him a standing ovation. Um, there, were, there were some, some – um, uh, Keith and Tommy uh, coming to the team and, and freshmen were allowed to be a part of the varsity team at that time. Uh, you know, getting together to, to know those guys, I'd watched them play through high school. Um, and uh, getting to know them, that was a special time for me, being uh, the elder statesman of the team at that time and uh, getting to know the, the youngsters on the team and taking them through the, you know, the indoctrination of uh, rookie hazing. So tell us the story. You're in L.A., to play a game, and you're driving to the arena, and you and Bill Hillgrove are in the car, to, and you get lost? Yeah, there was a, you know, back in those days, we had rental cars. We didn't have a bus. Uh, there were like five or six rental cars that transported the players to the arena. <clears throat> and the car I was riding in got lost on the way to to uh, Inglewood, from our hotel to Inglewood. So when we arrived at the arena, it was the national anthem was playing as we walked into the arena. So uh, I didn't have time. I was the only player in the car, but I, I didn't have time to, to warm up or to uh, go through any stretching or I had time to get my ankles taped, put on my uniform, and go out there for the tip-off. Well, why didn't you just pull up the Waze app on your phone? <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't, we didn't even have a phone. We didn't even have a phone at People that time. People can't identify with that. It's, uh, no, it's hard to identify with it. It's you know, hard. Because now you just you type it in and you go, and it yeah. tells you when to turn and where to go, but back well, then. Well, I didn't, I didn't even have a driver's license at that time, so um, probably. Um, so you weren't driving. I wasn't driving, <laughs> that's for sure. And um, we got lost, and uh, we were good and lost. We were good and lost because we left the hotel probably right after lunch. But um, – for we, didn't, a night we, game? Didn't, we didn't make it to a night game, right? We were, <laughs> <laughs> it was, we were good and lost, but um, it, we got there in time. I mean, the coach was with us too, so oh, I wasn't so it, by myself. It was so you had an alibi. You had the coach, the coach with you. So in, uh, I think that was the problem. So many guys were in there talking and saying they knew the way, but uh, I don't think anyone knew the way. It's like the amoeba route yeah. to get there, <laughs> but it, this one didn't work. I, I want to get your thoughts about your days after Pitt and what it was like to see what the team did last year uh, and the excitement around the program coming back again as we continue with Billy Knight here on the Jeff Capel Show on the Pitt Panthers Radio Network. We are joined by Billy Knight here on the Jeff Capel Show at the GBU Life Campus View Club here at the Peterson Event Center. What Billy didn't tell you is, and from the story before the break is he dropped 37 on UCLA without warming up. <laughs> yeah, I was tempted not to warm up anymore but <laughs> the rest of my career, but I, I thought better of it after a while. How would you describe yourself as a player? Um, I probably would be an all-around player. I mean, I, I could rebound, I could score, I could shoot um, and score different ways, but I just considered an all-around type of a player, not – strictly a shooter or strictly an inside guy or not strictly one thing but just do a little bit of everything do you look at today's game and think oh, i wish i would have played then not financially mm. just the game itself well, it's a different game nowadays it's totally a different different style of play i mean i 
you know, I still uh, shriek when, uh, you know, a player drives to the hoop and has an opportunity for a layup and throws it out for a three. But that's, that's old school. That's the old school me that looks at it that way. But um, um, it's just a different game. They play different, and we played differently than the era before our, our time. So it's, um, it's the way that the, the game evolves. It's going to keep evolving, too. It's not just going to stop. Now it's going to continue. You know, when you have a player like uh, Victor Wimbanyama, you know, coming into the the, the, the ranks of basketball. I mean, That's this guy is a, is a phenomenal. Yep. That, uh, you can't you can't describe, or you couldn't even imagine somebody like him being available to play basketball. Do you have pride in the fact that you guys really laid the foundation for what oh, we see now? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. We're very proud of the, of the team as it is now, but we're, we're proud of the work we did over the years to, 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 to play and to uh, establish a, a, a basketball culture within Pittsburgh. I mean, those were the, the basketball heydays, you know, back in those days. Some of the greatest players uh, from in, throughout the entire country were, were playing in Pittsburgh at that time. I mean, Connie Hawkins was here. I got to know him. Uh, Kenny Durrett, who was uh, – a phenomenal, greatest high school player I'd ever seen. So there were so many great players that um, were proud to be a part of it. All right. I, I, I hesitate to say never, but how many times have people thought, oh, are you Brandon Knight? No, no that doesn't happen. He's, he's a little guy, so nobody, nobody's mixed this up. You know, I, you, know, like, you know, he's a great guy. Brandon's a great, great, great player. Uh, but we tease, you know, when you're when you're a bigger than average guy, you tease little guys. We tease them all the time. I, the last time I saw him, I told him I could I could eat lunch off the top of his head. So, you know, you, you always tease little guys. What was it like for you to watch the excitement around the program last year? Oh, it was great. It was great to see because you 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 know, this one thing. I know I played in the pros and you know for a lot of years, and I've been a general manager in the pros, but. You can never replace the enthusiasm that that people and players have in college college sports, whether it's football, basketball, whatever. But that that's um, the enthusiasm is so real and so genuine that um, that that can never be duplicated. And um, that's what Pitt had last year, and it was it was fun to watch. It was fun to be here for some games, but also to watch on TV. Well, Billy, thank you for t- taking some time and joining us tonight. Oh, anytime, we appreciate anytime. it. Thank the you great for Billy Knight. Here at the Peterson Event Center, we come back. You know, playing Duke almost back-to-back is more than just a basketball matchup. Uh, Hoops for ALS is something that means a lot to Jeff Capel. We're going to talk to one of the organizers of Hoops for ALS as we continue on the Jeff Capel Show on the Pitt Panthers Radio Network. You may have noticed the the pin on Jeff Capel's shirt or even on John Shire's shirt during the game on Tuesday. Hoops for ALS. Uh, working with basketball coaches, players, and fans to really raise awareness for ALS, which is also called Luke Gehrig's disease. You might know it by that name. To promote research, to to gain advocacy, if I could say that word, for those dealing with this fatal disease. Tunch Yolkin is a beloved member of the Pittsburgh community. He also suffered from ALS. Um, But this Hoops for ALS game home and home game is something really special somewhere where we can gain more awareness of what it is tom habistraw joins us now give me a second here uh will be joining us soon um and he was part of this initiative and i know jeff capel's father dealt with it and and jeff has talked about it a little bit and i know it's very hard for him to watch what happened to his father it's still uh jason and jeff you know and, and they've done a lot with uh, ALS and trying to promote it over the last few years. So it's kind of neat that it's actually him and John Shire at Duke have kind of collaborated on this, that they're going to try to even draw more awareness. Uh, the horrors of the disease, uh, you know, when, when Jeff and Jason talk about their dad, and their dad was a beloved coach, coach in high school, coach in college, coach in the NBA with, with, with the Sixers and the Charlotte Hornets, um, and, and a powerful man. And you could see how quickly ALS deteriorates you and that was one of the things even with Lou Gehrig and you know growing up in New York that was the thing all of a sudden he went from his prime to relatively quickly he was no longer there and so again I know how much it means to the cables and how to this day it's so hard for them to talk about it yeah and and you can find more information on the Panthers website it's hoops for ALS where you can support you can learn more about this and Tom joins us now and 
Tom, I, I want to ask you, how did you become involved in this initiative? And I know you also have a very personal um, story that's connected with ALS. Yeah, unfortunately, my mother was diagnosed um, in 2017 to this fatal disease, 100% fatal. Um, there's no effective treatment to ALS, which is also known as Lou Gehrig's uh, disease. And when that happened, when my mom was diagnosed, my brothers and I were involved in a committee to get Lou Gehrig Day started at Major League Baseball, an annual uh, league-wide day to commemorate and uh, pay tribute to Lou Gehrig and raise awareness for ALS, the same disease that 80 years ago um, that he passed away from. And unfortunately, uh, Jeff Capel's father, Coach Capel, um, he and my mother both had the same prognosis as Lou Gehrig did when he was diagnosed 80 years ago. And so we started a committee out of Lou Gehrig Day, uh, a basketball-oriented one, where people like Jeff and I came together to do what we did with Major League Baseball and start an annual uh, ALS Awareness Day that would raise not just at, uh, you know awareness about the disease, but also raise funds and try to get more advocates on board. And so Hoops for ALS was started a, a couple years ago with some other advocates for ALS, including Jeff Capel. And we are so excited uh, to be partnered with Pitt Basketball to make this, uh, this dream a reality. We want to end this disease for once and for all. You were involved as well as the ALS Pe Pepper Challenge, and you guys raised over a million dollars. Um, how much do you see that impacting research for this disease? It's huge. Um, this is the only way we're going to beat this disease is to raise money to, uh, to fund research, important research. This is how it gets done. Um, and every dollar matters. You know, my mother, when she was diagnosed, uh, she wanted to start a movement. And so what we did was we started the ALS Pepper Challenge, and the funds were going to a great institute, uh, ALS TDI, the ALS Therapy Development Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts, they do great work, and we were so excited that our ALS pepper challenge where you ate spicy peppers, really hot peppers, habaneros, jalapenos, the Carolina Reaper, um, and recorded <laughs> yourself and posted those videos like the Ice Bucket Challenge, um, we raised over a million dollars for research, and that actually helped put a drug to market um, and to test uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, we, we wanted to actually do a clinical trial and in order to do a clinical trial, you have to raise enough money to do it. So that's why it's so mm. imperative for us to raise money uh, yep. is the only way we're going to invent a new drug or an effective treatment is if we eat a lot of hot peppers or talk about <laughs> it during basketball games. And so that's why we're doing Hoops for ALS is that any, any uh, awareness that we can do around the disease, um, we want to make sure we can do it. And that's why Jeff and I partnered to make this happen. So how is, how is your – uh, palette now for hot peppers. <laughs> well, oh, man. Um, I've eaten so many habaneros in my life, way more <laughs> than I ever intended. Um, on the Dan Levitard show a couple of years ago, I ate a Carolina Reaper live on air. Um, that is the hottest pepper in the world. I was going to say, I don't know what that is, but it Doesn't sounds sound bad. Good. <laughs> yeah. It's 400 times hotter than a jalapeno, Okay. So if you think a jalapeno is oh. hot, multiply it times 400. I was, uh, I was horizontal for about four hours <laughs> after, let's just put it that way. Tom, so it was super hot, but I would do anything, anything to have no one else have to deal with ALS. So my pain with that disease, that, that pepper is nothing compared to the devastation of this disease. So I am more than happy to eat a Carolina Reaper or a hundred more hominids. Tom, what? When the Panthers go to Duke next Saturday, it's going to be another hoops for ALS game. How can people get involved? What can they do to help? ALS.net slash Pitt Duke. So P-I-T-T. -T. I don't even need to tell you how to spell Pitt. Come on. P-I-T-T -T <laughs> Duke. Um, so ALS.net slash Pitt Duke. That is how you go to donate. Um, that all those funds will go to research both at ALS TDI and both uh, the ALS clinics at Pitt and Duke were supporting the research that will one day uh, provide cures to this disease. And so uh, what I want you to do is go on your phone, 
uh, go to that website. And also, go tell people about this. There's probably someone listening right now who has someone close to them with this disease, fighting this disease, or someone they know who lost, they've lost to this disease. Um, we need you. We need your help. We need to come together on this one uh, because this is one of the few re diseases in the world where there are no effective treatments and no cures. So with my mom, unfortunately, with uh, Jeff Capel's father, it was a death sentence, and we are trying to work together to make sure that we do not have that for the next generation, and you can be a part of it by going to als.net slash pit duke. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, we really appreciate all your work, and we advocate for everybody to go check out that website and help wherever you can. Thanks, Tom. You got it. Thank you so much for having me on. Tim O'Toole is joining us, and Tim, when we come back, there are four head coaches on your staff. I think most people understand that. I want to ask you how that works, <laughs> what, what it's like when you guys get together, how you put all this stuff together as we continue on the Jeff Capel Show on the Pitt Panthers Radio Network. And our special guest host, associate head coach Tim O'Toole, who is a head coach along with Lon Brown was a head coach, along with Jason Capel and, of course, Jeff Capel as the head coach. Probably heard that story before, but what's that like when so much knowledge as you guys get together and, and look at film and put game plans together? It's exciting. I think the reality is you also realize, all right, you know, Jeff is the boss. You got to know where you fit in the pecking order of all this thing. And uh, and I do think the reality is being a head coach, you're aware of how hard, at least in my opinion, that job is. And so there's a tremendous respect level that I think we do have for each other. You know, you definitely value the, the opinion because you know they've been in these situations where there aren't always easy answers or the right answers. And so you're kind of muddling your way through things. And I do think a lot of times we just try to offer suggestions or advice. And then sometimes you don't say anything. You know, I mean, there's, you know Jeff is thinking about these things 365, 24 hours a day. And, um, and when he wants your opinion, he'll ask for it. But, but, but there's so much give and take where you do respect the living heck out of all of each other. And one thing Jeff says, because we talk about this with the recruits, like this is a family. And a, and a family, and it kind of sounds cliche-ish, right? But, but no, I, I was fortunate to work with Jeff 25 years ago at Duke University where I coached him when he was a junior and senior. Jason is obviously his brother. Milan was a GA for Jeff's dad at Old Dominion 25 years ago. So the Capels have known Milan and the Capels have known myself. And, uh, and now that we're all kind of part of this thing, we do kind of, I, I believe we operate in a pretty good fashion because of the respect level of not only where we've been, but that we, but we've known each other for a long period of time. And, um, and, and I do believe we all respect the living heck out of Jeff. And, and, and that being said, respect Pittsburgh. We love being here. We love the university. We love everything about the program and the ACC. And, uh, but we've got a great staff. We've got great people. And it's, uh, it's fun to be a part of it. Panthers are off this weekend back Tuesday night against Syracuse at 7 o'clock. Let's talk about that matchup as we continue. Tim O'Toole in for Jeff Capel on the Jeff Capel Show on the Pitt Panthers Radio Network. And we're joined by associate head coach Tim O'Toole. It's the first of back-to-back -back games or seeing an opponent for a second time. What do you take away from that Syracuse game and thoughts on the matchup coming up on Tuesday? I think we have to look at some of the things that happened against us. And we played pretty well in the first half. I think we were up 8, 30, 8, 30 or ballpark in that range. One of the things Syracuse is really good is they're good at getting the ball out and going. If they can force a turnover or steal, it's usually resulting in a fast break bucket. But the other thing they're really good at, as soon as they get the rebound, they're in go mode. And that was the one of the things that really hurt us when we played there. Turnovers led to buckets, but then also their, their ability to control the glass and get out and score really hurt us. I do think rebounding is a big key for this game because we have to be very good at it. And we weren't good up there. So coming back and how we're going to reverse those, those fortunes, if you would, our team's got to do a great job, and we'll call it gang rebound where you send five to the glass all night long. Their bench hurt us, and we got to make sure that doesn't happen again. Is it a thing, too, where you can overthink it too much? Like, you pretty much know what you have to do, or do you get into these games, well, okay, they expect us to do this, we're going to do this? Well, I think the reality is with that last one, it goes back to the first question you asked me about being physical. When it comes to rebounding, there's – it's not really a question of thinking. It's go hit someone, find it, and then go get the ball. And that's what we didn't do consistently enough where Copeland and this kid Brown did. And uh, unfortunately, the, the, the tide turned against us. But 
we got to do that at a high clip, and we should be better than we were. Well, Tim, you do a great job of broadcasting, but you're a better coach, so I'm glad <laughs> where, where, you're where you're at. Thank you for stopping by. No, thank you for having it. me. No one else wants me, so I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, yeah. thanks to Billy Knight and Curtis Aiken as well, to Amanda and Dom, and ALS.com slash Pitt Duke on the Pitt Panthers radio network.